Almighty God, we do bless your name for the Bible study tonight. Thank you, Lord, for prospering our journey to come here. Thank you for the protection and the preservation of our lives. We well, thank you, Lord, because you created us and you have redeemed us. And so that we can do your will here on earth. We are praying, Lord, the grace to be obedient to you so that we will not be hearers of the word only, but will be doers of the word. Grant us the grace in Jesus' name. We know that you bless obedience. Therefore, Lord, we pray the kind of obedience you bless, prompt obedience, unquestioning obedience, unwavering obedience, wholehearted obedience. Lord, we pray you grant to everyone in Jesus' name. Make us, Lord, a blessing in your church, a blessing in the world, and a blessing to everyone around us. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I welcome you to the Bible study tonight. It's wonderful to have you uh, combined together in all our districts. Uh, those who are represented here. We're continuing with our study of the Acts of the Apostles. And now we're in Acts chapter 11. It's a very important chapter, and especially at the beginning of the year, that the Lord can set the tone for us as to what direction to go in your personal life, what direction to go in your spiritual life, what direction to go in our church as local churches and our church as a whole. I want you to know the background to this, the story we're reading. Very important, in chapter 10, the Lord had revealed himself unto Cornelius by an angel. And the angel had revealed to him that he still needed something more than being religious, being traditional, just praying and giving alms. And that that way of the Lord, the way of the salvation of the Lord, will be revealed unto him through Simon Peter. And the angel described where to find Simon Peter. Immediately he obeyed. And he sent people to Simon Peter. At the same time, the Lord was revealing to Simon Peter that these uh, people will be coming and he'll call him to come and preach the word to them. And because it was a new experience for Peter that was going to reach the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, the people that were not Jewish, not Israelites like himself. It was totally new. And therefore the Lord had to reveal to him three times over. It shall arise and kill and take both the clean and the unclean. The Lord was saying both the circumcised and the uncircumcised could have the salvation of the Lord. He first of all said, no Lord, that cannot be. But the Lord told him, this is the will of God and it's according to the word of the Lord. Eventually those people came and then the Spirit said that he should go with them. And eventually he went with them and he got there. He saw them, they were all gathered together. And in fact, Cornelius said, we are all here to listen to what you have to say and then to do what the Lord will have us do. And he preached the word unto them. While he was still preaching, the Holy Ghost came on them. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then Peter said, what was, what was I that I could hinder God, seeing that they have received the same Holy Spirit as we have received. Then they pleaded with him, he should stay with them a few days, and he stayed with them so that he can follow them up and help them to understand the new faith into which they had come. That's the background of the story. Now, Peter came back to Judea, and the people in Judea, they challenged him, we heard what you've done. How could you have done that? That was something strange to them. But it was strange to them because they were not thinking about the word of the Lord. What the Lord had said. Let's go back to Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 8 for you to know what the Lord expected them to do. And even though the day of Pentecost had come and they had received the Holy Ghost, their baptism, yet they had not got done what the Lord expected them to do. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 8. But he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Lord had told them that they were going to evangelize the world. They were going to tell the good story, the beautiful story of Christ's redemption. That Jesus Christ came, 
Then he died on the cross and he was buried on the third day. He rose again for the salvation of humanity and the salvation of everyone. They will start in Jerusalem and then there will be Judean ministry. There will be the Samaritan ministry and then they will go to the uttermost part of the earth. I want you to look at your word there. I don't want you to miss out. Look at that verse 8 once again. In uh, Acts of the Apostle chapter 1 verse 8, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. What's the next word there? Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto that uttermost part of the earth. The way the apostles and the disciples had done it is that first in Jerusalem, then when you finish that, then in Judea, when you finish that, then in Samaria, when you finish that, then to the uttermost part of the earth. But the Lord said both, which means that while you are in Jerusalem, it will never finish because children will be born, people are growing up, more people are coming, so you keep on doing that. And then in Judea as well, and Samaria, then to the uttermost part of the earth, everything should go on all together. It means, number one, you are reaching the Jews. Number two, you are reaching the Gentiles. And you are reaching those people. You are creating the time, the ministry towards the Jews and towards the Gentiles. By the way, they have spent seven years already in the evangelization of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And they had not thought about going to the Gentiles to go and preach unto them. And so eventually the Lord spoke to Peter and, he, and they impressed it upon him and revealed to very clearly that this is what should be done. And so eventually he went and when he came back, we're now in Acts chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 1. And the apostles and the brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. They knew that something had happened. The people have been called to repentance, and these people are not just repenting. They were saved, they were sanctified, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke in tongues just like these other disciples and apostles had done earlier. And so the apostles in Jerusalem, and all the brethren in Jerusalem, the church over there at the headquarters, they heard that these Gentiles, contrary to their expectation, and contrary to what they were ever planning, what they were thinking about, that these people, they had repented. These people, they had been saved. And these people are not just saved, they were even set fast and separated from the pollutions and the sinful things all around them. Their repentance was shown. And the word of God had had a transforming effect in their lives. And they were told in verse 2, Then and when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, that that, that uh, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. He came back to Jerusalem, and when he came back to Jerusalem, they were waiting for him because they had heard what had happened and what he had done. He had gone to those Gentiles, he had eaten with them, he had stayed with them, he had lived with them, he had preached the word of God to them. And so they were waiting for him, and it says they contended with him. That's an important word. They contended with him, saying in verse 3, that went in to men uncircumcised. Understand? That was the bone of contention. The bone of contention. The uncircumcised people, the gentle people, those idolatrous people, you have gone to preach the gospel to them, and you even edge with them. You edge with them. I want you to understand that something is missing here, and uh, that's why we need to check up our Christian experiences. The Lord had told them something earlier. He had told them that when the Holy Ghost has come, something will happen. It's not just that you speak in tongues. There are people that only speak in tongues, but all the other evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, empowering of the Holy Spirit, enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, the enveloping of the Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit, all those things are missing. What are the things missing here now? We're looking at John chapter 14. In John chapter 14 verse 26, for the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He's talking about when the Holy Ghost will come. 
and you'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You'll be immersed in the Holy Ghost. When that Holy Ghost will come, it will enlighten you, it will instruct you, it will show you the way, it will show you the very mind of God. Look at this, it says, He shall teach you all things. He shall teach you all things. See, the Holy Ghost, when He comes in that baptismal measure, He will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Brothers and sisters, this is even more important than merely speaking in tongues. That he'll bring to your remembrance the plan of God, the purpose of God, the will of God, and the plan of salvation for the whole of humanity. Everything I told you before is going to remind you and is going to guide you into all truth. Well, the Lord has spoken to Peter. And Peter went according to the word of God. In fact, he said, the Spirit bid me go. If they were living in the enjoyment of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what the Lord had revealed to Peter, the Lord will reveal to them that this is my will, this is my way, and this is what I want to accomplish. And actually, the children of Israel in their number, they were less than the rest of the world. And Jesus died for the world. They should have remembered because the second day, the next day, John said, Jesus coming, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, we take it away, tell me. The sins of the Jews, tell me out loud, the sins of the world. And so they should have understood that Jesus Christ died for the world. For God so loved the world, didn't you remember that? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever, a Jew or a Gentile, will not perish but have everlasting life. The Holy Ghost should have reminded them they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. How many people today are saved? How many people today say they are sanctified? How many people today say they are baptized in the Holy Ghost and they are speaking in tongues? And the basic things we ought to remember, that we ought to do, we don't remember. And when other people, they live in the enjoyment of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they remember, and they are being taught by the Holy Ghost and they go in the right direction, it appears that these other people who are baptized in the Holy Ghost, so to say, they do do not remember look at John chapter 16 in John chapter 16 I'm reading from verse 12 it says in verse 12 I have yet many things to say unto you but she cannot bear them now one of those things they wanted to tell them is that the Jews and the Gentiles they have equal privilege at Calvary equal privilege of the cross equal privilege through Jesus Christ our Savior he said I have yet many things to say unto you the Gentiles are going to get saved the Gentiles are going to get sanctified and the Gentiles are going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. They're going to have the same privilege, the same promise, the same provision, the same experience as the Jewish people. I cannot tell you now, but look at verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is calm. Think about that. When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you are baptized in the spirit of truth. And the truth of the Spirit saturates your heart. Truthfulness becomes the, the mark of your life, totally and completely, inwardly and outwardly, in the private and in the public. But they didn't understand that being baptized in the Holy Ghost is not just speaking in tongues. It's the Spirit of truth coming upon you, and He will guide you into all truth. You see that? When that Holy Ghost has come, and these people seven years earlier, they have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. And Peter, of course, had been baptized in the Holy Ghost, and the Lord revealed to him by the Spirit, interpreting the trance he had unto him, that this is the way of the Lord, and this is the will of the Lord, that the Gentiles will receive the Gospel, just like the Jewish people had received the Gospel. He said, he will guide you into how much truth? All truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Let's come back now to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. And uh, Peter had yielded to the Holy Spirit, had responded to the Holy Spirit, had gone to do what the Lord wanted him to do. Look at verse 2 again. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, 
contended with him. They that were of the circumcision contended with him. I want you to look at that word, contended. That means they, they called him and it wasn't a pleasant thing. It wasn't a lowly voice. It's like, you know, it was a real battle. It was a real conflict. It was almost like real fighting of words. It's like, uh, you know, they, they brought him to question. They said, how could this happen? They were not soft at all. They were very, very vocal about what they did. We can almost say that, you know, they were aggressive and they were kind of imposing on uh, Peter and they were waiting for him, very, very aggressive. And in your life, before you do that to a preacher, before you do that to a pastor, before you do that to a minister of the gospel, think through. If he is acting by the spirit and you are acting by tradition, if he is acting by this is the revelation of the Lord and this is the way to go, and you are acting on the basis of as it was, so it is, and so will it ever be. If he is acting of the revelation of the spirit of God and the move of the spirit of God, and you are acting on old testament, old covenant, something that is way beyond before salvation, before knowing the Lord, before real conversion and then you come in aggressive uh, attitude and action and then you are contending you should uh, think through and say what are you contending about i'm looking at proverbs chapter 29 verse 29 proverbs chapter 29 chapter 29 verse 9 it says in chapter 29 verse 9 if a wise man contended with a foolish man whether he rage or laugh there is no rest what brings unrest in the church? Contention. What brings conflict in the church? Contention. What brings conflict and unrest in the family is contention. When the leader is acting by the move of the spirit and the people say, but how can that be? We've never done it like this before. We've never gone this direction before. This is the way we have always gone. Why the change? Why the modification? Why this? And when the leadership is acting by revelation that this is what the spirit of God wants in this new year, and then the people that are still 20 years behind, they're still 100 years behind, they come in contention and you know the, the one that is led by the spirit that's the wise man and the one that is led by tradition by the flesh that is the foolish man and it says well, if a wise man contended with a foolish man whether he rage or laugh even if they are you know soft about it and even if they are nice about it even if they smile in that contention even if they laugh in that or the aggressive and boisterous and raging it's the same there will be no there will be no rest but the lord has told us what to contend about look at jude verse 3 we're looking at uh, the epistle of of uh, jude in verse 3 it says uh, beloved when i give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should honestly contend for tell me that is you honestly content for honestly content for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We're not to contend for tradition. We're not to contend for Jewish culture. We're not to contend for this is the way it was, and this is the way it is, and this is the way it will ever be. We're to contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. What is the faith once delivered unto the saints? Look at your Bible. That's the faith was delivered unto the saints. Look at what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. That is the faith that is uh, that was uh, delivered unto the saints. Look at the New Testament and look at the doctrine of salvation and sanctification, and Holy Ghost baptism, and one wife, uh, one with one man. And look at the rapture. Look at you know the second coming of the Lord. Look at the faith was delivered unto the saints. Look at evangelism. Look at holiness. And look at good into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature every creature that is the faith once delivered unto the saints but the tradition of only jerusalem tradition only the jews tradition only the circumcised tradition only this a small group and no more that one is tradition and the lord has not called us to contend for 
any tradition. As you look at the church, you'll find, you know, many things in the church. If you were here with us, 1973, maybe you were not, but I'll tell you. If you were here, you'll know that the faith was delivered unto us. See, the nucleus, the centrality, and the pure thing, what gets people saved and sanctified and made holy, and then baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then everywhere we went, we took the Great Commission seriously, going into all the world, and preached the gospel to every creature. That is the faith once delivered unto the saints. Content for that. There were other things as things came on. You know, the time to start service, whether it is 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, that one, we can decide that one. We don't need to contend about that. If we say now we're going to start at 8 o'clock, that's, that's our decision. That one is not faith delivered unto the saints. If we say we're going to have it from workers, we're going to have a workers retreat, a workers retreat will be from Wednesday to Saturday, that's all right. If we change that and we say, no, it will be from Friday to Sunday. That's all right. That one is in the time of the meeting and the time of the workers retreat and the time of the conference and the type of meetings we're having. That one is not the faith. What's delivered unto the saints? We're not going to waste our lives arguing and contending about tradition, about this or that. You know, there are people that they, they argue about some of these things that are not necessary. Contend earnestly for the faith once delivered unto the saints. It tells us what not to contend for. It tells us what to contend for. And those uh, people in Jerusalem, as Peter came back and were contending, were contending for the wrong thing. Deuteronomy chapter 2. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, I'm reading to you from verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 2, I'm reading to you from verse 9. It says, And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle. The Lord said, these uh, Moabites don't contend of them. You see, the Lord draws the line, and the Lord sets the stage, and the Lord tells us what not to contend for, and then what to contend for. In that verse 9, it says, contend not with the Moabites in battle, for I will not give them, I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given heir unto the children of Lord for a possession. Look at verse 24, that same chapter, verse 24, rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river, and on. Behold, I have given into thine hand Sihon, the Amorite, the king of Heshbon, and this land begin to possess, and what? Tell me out loud. Contend with him in battle. You see, verse 9, he said, this one don't contend. Then in verse 24, it says, this one contend. Will the church then learn? And will you as a believer, learn? will you as a Christian worker, learn? will you as a Christian minister, will you learn the things not to contend about? Tradition, culture, circumcision, uncircumcision, men, women, this or that. Things not to contend about, but the things to contend about, honestly contending for the faith, once delivered unto the saints. You don't want to contend with the Lord. You don't want to contend with the word of the Lord. I'm looking at Job chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. Job chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? The Almighty God had revealed to Peter, and I said, Arise, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. I've never done anything like that. The Lord said again the second time, Peter, I said, Arise, kill and eat. And he said, I've not done that. Nothing common, nothing unclean ever entered my mouth. The third time, the Lord said, Arise, kill and eat. What God has cleansed, call that not common. Call that not unclean. And because of being instructed by the Lord, and because of being led by the Lord, and because of being taught by the Lord, he went to the house of Cornelius, and then he did what the Lord told him to do. Everything was perfect. The Holy Ghost came upon those people, and then he came back now, and they were content.
contending with him. What were they doing? They were contending with the Almighty because Peter did not go by himself. His decision was not by himself. And the thing he did over there, the Lord gave approval as the Holy Ghost came upon them as he came upon us at the beginning. And so these people there were contending with the Almighty. Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. That was the situation here. And uh, I pray that God will help us to be doers of the word in Jesus' name. So that we don't, uh, this uh, new year, we don't waste our lives and waste our breath and waste our energy and waste our resources contending about tradition, contending about, you know, this or that, opposing each other, fighting each other, contending with each other on things that are not necessary at all. And then eventually Peter came back and he told them uh, that this is what happened. Come back to Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, and I'm reading here from verse 17. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I, that I could withstand God? He said, look at what God has done, and look at the, look at the result of what God has done, and because of this result, what do you think? What was I that I could contend with the Almighty? Then he said, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then as God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Then they said, God has granted these people repentance unto life. How did they know that? They knew that because the people were saved, the people were sanctified, and the people were filled with the Holy Ghost transformation in their lives. And they even demanded that Peter will now stay with them and show them more the way of God and the will of God. And then eventually they now said, all right, if that has happened, we now agree. But you know, all the argument before that agreement, all the contention before that agreement, that agreement, all that disagreement and all the exchange of words before that, uh, before that understanding, didn't God say that when we're sanctified, we'll be one as the Father and the Son are one, I in them and thou in me, that they all may be one in us. Sanctification brings unity and sanctification brings humility that you're willing to listen to the other person. Let him tell the story. Let him show you what God himself had done. Let him show you how God led him from where he was to where he went and then as he came back and then glorify God and praise the Lord for what the Lord has done rather than making up your mind that you know this cannot be and this cannot be right because we've never done it that way and we're not going to do it that way. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the review and revelation of cross-cultural mission. The review and the revelation of cross-cultural missions. Number two, the response and resourcefulness of consecrated missionaries or consecrated ministers. The same thing, a missionary, a minister. A minister ministering the word of God, preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God, expounding the word of God, explaining the word of God, and sending the word of God forth into the lives of people. It's a missionary when you go to the other side and you go beyond your culture and you go beyond the territories and then you want to cover and reach every land. And any minister, while you are there, that you are in the house fellowship or you are in the local church or you are a zona leader there or you are a coordinator over there and then you are teaching the word of God for people to get saved and for believers to get sanctified and for the sanctified, purified, holy, saintly believers, the baptized in the Holy Ghost, or to develop the faith of people, or to emphasize once again and affirm once again and explain once again the faith and the body of doctrines delivered unto the saints. Those are the ministers of God and the review and the, the, the review and the revelation of cross the cultural missions and then the response and resourcefulness of consecrated ministers. Number three, their readiness for the respons responsibility of a caring ministry, a caring ministry. That you know that you are saved to serve. 
and then because of that you care you care for those in need you care for those who have peculiar problems and then you're able to reach out to the hands of love and compassion and mercy unto all the people come back to number one that is the review and revelation of cross cultural missions here peter now was going to explain to them why did i do what i did why did i go where i went why did i mix with those uh, jewish people and uh, those gentiles why did i go to preach the word of god to them look at this in acts of the apostle chapter 11 verse 4 but peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them he was going to set everything the way it ought to be all the experiences he had earlier that made him to go to the house of Cornelius I was going to repeat that to them now he said I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision a certain vessel descend and as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners and it came even to me upon the which when I had I had fasting mine eyes I considered and so forth footed bees of the earth and wild bees and creeping things and fowls of the air and I had a voice saying unto me arise Peter slay and eat and I said not so Lord he knew it was the Lord talking not so Lord you know you wonder sometimes somebody is born again and then when you are born again you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior you accept Jesus as your master and your Lord. You call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If you know that he is Lord, he is the one that saved you. Are you going to know the way of salvation more than the Savior? Are you going to know what is acceptable to the Savior more than the Savior himself? And so if you are saved and you are taking Jesus Christ as your Savior, taking Jesus Christ as your Lord, taking Jesus Christ as your master, and as your master, you know that you are the servant of the Lord. You know that you are a slave of the Lord. And you know that you are totally subjected and submissive unto the Lord. Why would you say not so, Lord? That was a great uh, mistake uh, in the, on the side of Peter. Isn't that the mistake of many people today? The Lord says, this is the way. What key there in? Do you have the right to say not so, Lord? If he is Lord, then everything he says is so. Everything he says, he wants obedience. And the obedience he wants is not, you know, that you'll go and consult with flesh and blood. You'll go and consult with a friend. You'll go and consult with husband. Go and consult with a wife. Shall I get saved? Go and consult with your daddy. Shall I get saved? Go and consult with your children. Shall I receive Jesus Christ as my personal savior? Go and consult with somebody. Shall I obey the will of God? If he is Lord, then you know that that is number one in your life and you ought to reign supreme without a rival in your life and the obedience will be prompt and the obedience will be unquestioning and the obedience will be unwavering and the obedience will be wholehearted with all your heart all your soul all your mind you come to saying yes lord here am i i am willing to do your will that's the meaning of calling him lord if you call him lord you never should say not so come back to verse 8 and say and i said not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed that 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 call not thou come on the lord was saying the clean and the unclean referring to the circumcised and the uncircumcised referring to the jew and the gentile referring to the black and the white referring to the low and the high referring to those who are uh, defiled and those who are morally sound whatever everyone that jesus died for everyone go preach the gospel to everyone go tell them that jesus saved whether it's a Jew or it's a Gentile, the word of salvation is for everyone. That's what the Lord was telling him. And this was done in verse 10 three times, and all that, and all, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bid me go. And the Spirit bid me go. If you argue, you argue with the Spirit. The 
spirit bid me go. If you contend, you are cont contending against the spirit, the spirit bid me go. If you fight, you are fighting a lost battle because the spirit bid me go. If you disagree, you disagree with the Holy Ghost and you say you are born again by the spirit of God. You say you are sanctified by the purifying power, purifying fire of the Holy Ghost and you say you are baptized in mass, energized and enveloped and covered by the Holy Ghost, if you contend, if you fight, if you if you argue, you are fighting and contending, arguing with the Holy Ghost because the Spirit bid me go. What a serious matter then that a whole church with all those apostles and with all those leaders and with all those members, they will be fighting for circumcision. They forgot the cross. They forgot Christ. They forgot Calvary. They forgot conversion. They forgot the salvation as Savior. And it was this Peter that said there is no other name whereby we can be saved except this name of Jesus. He forgot all that. And then it is just this tradition. I I pray God will touch our hearts. I pray God will transform us. You never know, you never know when you begin to contend with, uh, you know, for tradition. You know, maybe you are in another denomination, another religious assembly, you know, before you came. And then as you came here, all those things in those other places that are just traditional things, you don't find them here. Here is just a simple, naked, bare word of God. And then we go into the word and we give out the word and you spread the word and say, but how about this? That's tradition. I about this. That one is culture. I about this. We say that one is dominational dogma. All those things don't come in here. And then you begin to fight. We're going to do it like this. You're fighting against the Holy Ghost. Where you are really born again. If you were born again before, where if you if you're fighting, then you are backsliding. When you come back to and you submit to the word of God, say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my Master. Tradition, no more. Circumcision no more. All those uh, dogmas of the of the denominations, no more. I now want to take your word as your word is. And I pray that God will make us so submissive to the word of God in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen over there. Yeah. It was 12. And the Spirit bid me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me and we entered into the man's house and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose son name is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. You see, the opposition was to opposition against the salvation of these people. If Peter had not yielded to the Lord and yielded to the voice of the Lord, they would not have been saved. They wouldn't have eternal life. They wouldn't go to heaven. And you don't want to be holding on to circumcision or tradition or opinions of men or your own personal preferences, your own personal opinion, that you want to worship your opinion instead of worshiping God. You want to worship your preference instead of worshiping God. You want to worship the dogmas of religion and the dogmas of denomination because that is what we're used to and you are not thinking about the salvation of the people who are perishing. He will tell you words whereby you will be saved. In verse 15, and as, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. The Holy Ghost fell on them as on us. And there was no difference at all. The same Holy Ghost came upon them, upon the Gentiles and the Jews. The same salvation, the same salvation, and the same sanctification, the same purity of heart, and the same type of holiness came in them. I saw it, and then the power of God came upon them, and they began to speak in other tongues. It was a clear tongue, and nobody taught them how to speak in tongues. This was real. Then it was then, look at, look at verse 16, then remembered I the word of the Lord. Then remembered I the word of the Lord. Then remembered I the word of the Lord. You know the problem? Look up here. In a church, when few people remember the word of the Lord and the, the majority of the people forget the word of the Lord, there will be fighting, there will be unrest, there will be conflict, there will be battle. 
there will be disagreement. When some people remember the word of the Lord, this is what he wants. This is what he has commanded. This one, he has not commanded it. Don't fight about that. This one, he has not ordained it. Don't fight about that. This one, he has not organized or arranged this. Don't fight about that. When you remember the word of the Lord, if you remember the word, I remember the word, she remembers the word, he remembers the word, and we all remember that same word, there'll be agreement, there'll be unity. We'll be going the same direction. When I remember, you remember. And Peter said, then I remembered the word of the Lord. How that he said, uh, before we go on, I want you to come to Hebrews chapter chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Put your finger in uh, Acts of the Apostles. I'm coming back there. In uh, Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Look at this. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness for us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts. I will put my laws into their hearts. I will write those things. He says, I'll put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds will I write them. In their minds will I write them. You know, the, 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 the problem is that the Lord said, I'll get you saved. I'll turn you around. I'm going to blot out your past. I'm going to wipe away your past. And your past will not be remembered anymore. How to commit sin. How to live like, you know, you used to. You even forget. Because this new life. Life will be so interesting, will be so exciting, will be so enjoyable that you'll be living the new life, you'll forget the past. Not only that, I will sanctify you. And when I sanctify you, I'm going to write my law on your mind, on your heart. And when you are sanctified, that same law is written on your heart. He is sanctified, that same law is written on heart. She is sanctified, that same law is written on the heart. And this other fellow is sanctified. And when we're all sanctified like that, he writes the law in our heart. And tell me, when he writes the law in our heart, and we remember the same thing. And the Lord is telling us, I've written there. The same thing I've written here in this sanctified heart, the same thing I wrote there in that sanctified heart, there'll be unity. It is when the law of God is not written in our heart. We only write it in the notebook and we forget it. And then we don't remember. But when that remembrance is there, when we remember and we recollect and we say that is the word of the Lord, we'll say yes to everything the Lord is saying. He tells, uh, you know, Peter, the apostle, he tells the leader, and that this is the way, and that same word is written, this other heart and that other and that other heart, there'll be unity, there'll be agreement. And we'll come back now to Acts chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 16. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that is said, John in deep baptized with water but you shall be baptized of the Holy Ghost and then for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ what was I that I should withstand God when they heard these things when they heard these things they held their peace. Well, thank God that everybody came to united understanding eventually. I said, thank God. I said, praise God. That everybody now came to understand. Do you know there are people that will just say, yes, I hear what you're saying. But we don't know whether they've lost their connection with the Lord. They have lost the voice of the Lord. That even when they hear everything from A to Z, from the beginning to the very end. And everything has been made very clear that this is the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. This is God that directed this. They hear everything and they still go back to act the same old way. Tradition has more impact on them than the transforming power of the Lord Jesus Christ, than the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you still say the same old thing. They still do the same old thing. Then you wonder, do they have any connection with the Holy Ghost? But these people, they had connection with the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord, they were saved. Praise the Lord, they were sanctified. Praise the Lord, the power, the enlightenment of the Holy Ghost was upon them. They held their peace and they glorified God, saying then, as God also to the Gentiles granted, 
repentance unto life. They rejoice because these people, they have received the word. But you know, all this had been written in the Old Testament. They should have known that. All this argument and contention and disagreement and conflict and battle with each other should not have been there. Look at Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, you know, this psalm is a messianic psalm. This is a psalm of the Savior. This is a psalm of the cross. This is a psalm of Calvary. Look at Psalm 22 verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's, those are the words Jesus said right there on the cross. Look at verse 7. All day that see me left me to scorn, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. Sin, he delighted in him. Uh, those are the words that he spoke, that you know, the things that happened on the cross. Look at verse 16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, and they pierce my hands, they pierce my, my feet. That's crucifixion right there. That's Jesus Christ on the cross for the salvation of humanity, for the salvation of everyone. Look at verse, uh, verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. That's Christ right there. Look at the result of that. In that same psalm, I'm looking now at verse 27. In verse 27, it says, All the ends of the world shall remember. They remember Calvary. All the ends of the earth shall remember the cross. They shall remember that Jesus Christ said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they will turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. You see that? Calvary draws everyone. If I be lifted up, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men from all nations unto myself. They should have remembered that, and that should have given no problem at all. Isaiah chapter 49, we're reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 49, and we're looking at verse 6. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, and he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of uh, of, of, of uh, Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. The Lord is saying this is a small thing. That will be a small part of your ministry. A small part of your accomplishment. It is a light thing for me to raise you up as the one that will gather together the tribes of Israel. I will also I will also I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be for be my salvation unto the end of the earth. You see that if they had remembered there's no argument that the Lord had already said Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ to save only the Jews, that's a light thing, that's a small thing, that's a minor thing, but then I'm going to raise him up he'll be for my salvation to all the Gentiles, look at Hosea chapter 2 verse 23 Hosea chapter 2 verse 23 and then you'll see what uh, the Lord had told the prophets of Israel that you know the time was coming when the Gentiles were coming to the faith Hosea chapter 2 verse 23 and I will sow her unto me in the earth and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy you see that those are, those are the Gentiles I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy I will say to they which are not my people thou art my people and they shall say thou art my God. Those are the Gentiles right there. If they had just read the word of God, remembered the word of God, they wouldn't have been saying why did you go to Cornelius? Why did you go to the Gentiles and to those of circumcised people? Why did you preach the word of God to them? By the way, this Hosea chapter 2 verse 23, you see what the Lord has said? He said, those who have not received mercy, I'll show them mercy. Those who are not my people, they'll be my people. Look at what uh, the New Testament says about that in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, and I'm reading here from verse, I'm reading here from verse 24. Romans chapter 9, verse 24, so that you will see that all these things, it's not just that, you know, somebody just uh, wakes up and says, this is what I want to do. This had been written down long, long before. Look at this in Romans chapter 9, verse 24. Even us, whom he has called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. See that? Even those of us who have been called, not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles. Verse 25, 
as he said also in Ose. Ose is uh, the new, uh, the, the Greek form of writing Ose. As he said in Ose, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and had beloved, which was not beloved. And, uh, and it shall come to pass in that, in that place where it was said, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. And so we find that if you only remember that there would have been no argument, there would have been no debate, there would be no disagreement, no discord, and no conflict, and there would be no contention. After I come to point number two, the response and resourcefulness of consecrated ministries or ministers or missionaries. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Something uh, new is uh, coming here now. Look at verse 19. It says in verse 19, now they which were gathered, they which were uh, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenicia and Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word to none but to the Jews only and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene which when they were come to Antioch spake unto the Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus. I want you to understand uh, it says in verse 19 preaching the word, preaching the word and then in verse in verse 20 preaching the Lord Jesus. You see if you preach the word of God you must uh, you must come eventually to preaching Christ because Christ is the savior that the word is talking about. Christ is a sanctifier that the word is talking about. Christ is a baptizer in the Holy Ghost that the word is talking about. Christ is the healer that the word is talking about and Christ is uh, he is the coming king that the word of God is talking about. So when it says they preach the word, they preach Jesus as savior. They preach Jesus as sanctifier. They preach Jesus as baptizer in the Holy Ghost. They preach Jesus as the healer, the redeemer. They preach Jesus as the Lord, as the master. And they put all the confidence of the people, the faith of the people on Jesus Christ that is preaching the word. Look at verse 21. The result of preaching the word and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. They preached the word of the Lord, and the word had impact. I pray the word will have impact in your life. They believed and turned. They believed and turned. They believed and turned. Action always follows faith. Action always follows faith. They believed on the Lord and they turned unto the Lord. And so, as you are hearing the word of God, if you have made a mistake before, I, I realize that's a mistake. I turn. I believe and I turn. If you committed sin before, as you hear the word of God, look at Jesus Christ. He died on the cross of Calvary for you. And the blood of Jesus Christ has us from all sin. You believe and you turn. And then, if you, your heart was not holy, your heart was not pure, your heart was not sanctified, you were saved, outward sins, adultery, fornication, lying, stealing, all that is gone, but inside you, there's still that carnality, that depravity, there's that thing that is pulling you down from the inside, as you hear the word of you, turn and you believe, and when you, you believe, you say, Lord, I know you can sanctify, I know you can purify, I know you can take this Adamic nature and this sin that is pulling me downward, you can take it away from me, you believe and you turn. There's always a, an action of faith. And then if you have been saved and sanctified, and then you realize you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto him, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, or to the first part of the earth, and say, I am powerless. I'm, I'm dry. I don't know why things are like this. Praise the Lord, I'm saved. Praise the Lord, I'm sanctified. I need the power of the Holy Ghost, the energy of the Holy Ghost, the might of the Holy Ghost. I need the fire within me to be born in of the Holy Holy Ghost, you believe and then you turn to the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost will come upon you in Jesus' name. When we believe, there's always an action, there's always something that follows that we really believe and when you come to the Bible study, this Bible study you are coming this year will be different in Jesus' name. It will not be like, okay, I've heard, I've heard and nothing happens. Every time we hear the word of God this year, something will happen. It will happen in your heart, happen in your body, happen in your life. You'll never be the same again after hearing the word of God in Jesus' name. And so 
they heard the word of the Lord and it turned. I want you to look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. The hearing of the word of God, believing the word of God does something in our lives, does something in our hearts, does something in our personality. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in what only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And it says, and ye became followers of us. You see, they had the word of God. It transformed them. It changed them. It made them new creatures in Christ. It made the Lord their Savior, their Lord, and their Master. And they became the willing servants of the Lord. And it says, ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you. How ye turned, you see that, how ye turned, when they believed they turned. When they believed something happened, a new life came into them. They were not the same old people they used to be, talking the same old way, dressing the same old way, looking the same old way, going to the same old place, worshiping the same old dead, old idols. It says that ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come condemnation taken away and the judgment to come everything taken away and let us come back to this uh, Acts of the Apostles I'm reading to you from chapter 11 Acts chapter 11 and I'm reading here now from verse 22 then the tidings of this is came unto the ears of the of the church which was in Jerusalem and they said Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch who when he came he had, and had seen the grace of God he was glad and he exhorted them all that were purpose of art they will cleave unto the Lord look up here for a moment the tidings of what happened in Antioch all that came to Jerusalem and they heard that it's not only in Caesarea it's not only in the house of Cornelius that the people have received the word of God and they have turned to the Lord even in Antioch and these other places they have received the word of the Lord and the word is making it transforming kind of change in their lives and so they said okay we're going to find out and they sent Barnabas well, Barnabas rise up you know what Barnabas did not say I wasn't thinking of going to a new place I want to stay in Jerusalem here I wasn't thinking I'll be transferred from here to there immediately Barnabas was told we hear that the work of God is going on there people are turning to the Lord and people are receiving the Lord and they told him go as far as Antioch Immediately he went. You see, when we are, when your life is centered in Christ, your life is centered in God, your life is centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord, he is Master, he is your Redeemer, he is the Captain of your salvation, he is the controller of your life. When the Lord says get up, you get up. When He says go, you go. You'll not be, you know, dragging your feet and still wondering uh, what kind of thing is this and popular here in Jerusalem and well known here in Jerusalem. Every Everybody knows me around here now. I'm going to a place where nobody knows me. There'll be nothing like that at all. Immediately he went. Who when he came and had seen the grace of God. Wait a minute. Grace is invisible. Grace is like air. The air we breathe. We don't see. How do we know then that grace is there? How do we know that the air is there? The breeze is there? Because when it blows, you see the effect. You see the effect. It's moving the trees, moving the branches. It's making some sounds on the ceiling. You see the wind is blowing. You do not see the wind. You see the effect of the wind. You do not see the grace, but you see the effect of the grace. And here it says, who when he came and had seen the grace of, had seen the invisible. How did you see that invisible grace? 
grace because he saw what grace had done what grace had done how do i know that you have grace because i cannot see that grace i can see the effect of the grace in your life look at this in titus chapter 2 titus chapter 2 this is what he saw in titus chapter 2 verse 11 for the grace of god you see that the grace of god that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world he saw that you know worldliness was gone he said that is grace he said that ungodliness defilement fornication adultery totally gone he said these people i see the grace of god here this is the effect of the grace and then he says they were living sober they were no more frivolous and careless they were no more talkatives and talk 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 and talk and they were not you know careless worldly people and they were not a defiled people anymore it is that righteousness is that sobriety is that holiness that purity that was the evidence of the grace and then so you should live godly in this present world. They were godlike. They were godly. They were not ungodly anymore. They were not like the world anymore. Things were different now. That is how we see the grace. When he had seen the grace of God, he was glad. He saw the grace of God in their change of life. Look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us? That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He saw that they were redeemed from all iniquity. Sin was no more in their lives. The people that you know before you have stealing, you have covetousness, you have idolatry, you have fighting, you have violence, you have worldliness, you have you know all these and various things. But all those things were gone. All iniquity was gone. So I see the grace. I see the grace. By the action of that grace in their lives, that's how we see the grace. And then to purify unto himself. These people were pure. They were pure. Their language pure. Their lifestyle pure. Their actions pure. Their interaction pure. Between the men and the women. Purity. Nothing. No bad story. No dirty story. No dirty jokes. Nothing like that. The purity was the evidence that they had the grace of God. When he had seen the grace of God ordinarily you don't see the wind ordinarily you don't see the grace it is the action of the grace and the transforming power of the grace that you saw in their lives and he said it was zealous of good words you had the zeal now they were not dull and dead and a kind of a lazy and like a desical and look up the passion the fire the desire and the enthusiasm was there when he said oh, to me let us go into the house of the Lord they were exhausted excited they enjoyed serving the lord and you could tell the thing that turned them on was serving the lord when he saw that zeal when he saw that passion when he saw that fire when he saw that excitement when he saw the enjoyment of the worship of the said i can see the grace of god here because the grace we see is evidenced by the action of that grace i want you to look at romans chapter 5 verse 17 he saw the grace of god he saw the grace of god what did he see I'll show you in Romans chapter 5 verse 17 for he by one man's offense death reigned by one much more much more they that receive the abundance of grace see that they that receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ they receive the grace of God they receive the righteousness of God when you saw righteousness they said I see grace here I see grace here when we see righteousness in your life that's we see the grace there when your language is righteous your comportment is righteous your conduct is righteous your character is righteous your dressing is righteous and your dressing leads other people to want to be righteous and they want to worship the lord and the beauty of holiness because of your appearance we see we see the grace of god in your life but when you are rough when you're like a rascal when you are like a ruffian, when you are like a person that has never tasted of the grace of God, when you are like a person that has never had the touch of Christ, you are still the old creature, the old personality, and your life is raw, and your language is raw, and your dressing is kind of, you know, blousy and disturbing, and we, we cannot even describe it, and it's terrible, and then you are leading the minds of men to think about sin, about immorality. We say, where is the grace? Where is the grace? It's one we see that righteousness and the purity and the zeal and the peculiarity and the conduct that is according to the word of God we say that 
is grace. If grace is there, righteousness will be there. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading to you from verse 29. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. When he had seen the grace of God, oh, did he see? This is what he saw. Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You see that? When your language is just, just normal, your language is pure, your language is righteous, and your language makes us remember Christ, your language makes us remember heaven, your language makes us remember glory, your language makes us to remember good people, saintly people, everything you do, things coming out of your life is ministering grace to other people. That's grace, that's grace. But you know the people that they say they are born again, I'm saved by grace. We say, where is the grace? Because the life is still as dirty as ever before. And the language is still as rough as ever before. And the, the life, like a ruffian, like, you know, all these cowboys, everything is still rough. We say, where is the grace? The grace will make you gentle. The grace will make you righteous. The grace will make you uh, nice to people. Look at this and grip not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Verse 31 Let all bitterness, all bitterness, all wrath and all anger and all clamor and all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. When there's no malice there, no revenge, no retaliation and there's nothing you are trying to do to get even and to torment or torture anybody or to you know, destroy anybody that's the grace. What when you are angry? You're clamorous. Dabrous. You pounce some people. You have the temper of a tiger, the temper of a lion. And you always enjoy wanting to tear other people apart and tear their lives apart and disturb their lives. When there's something like that, there's no grace there. The grace that comes makes us to get rid of bitterness and of forgiveness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and all malice in verse 32 be ye, be ye kind one to another tender hearted forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you come back to Acts of the Apostles we're looking at uh, verse uh, chapter 11 verses 25 and 26 Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 and I'm reading to you now from verse 25 and verse 20 and verse and verse 26, then Barnabas, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus eh, for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And he came, came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church that they had taught much people. And the disciples were called, what name? Tell me out loud. Christians first in Antioch. Uh, can you see this? The people, they were getting converted. They are becoming disciples, discipling a whole nation. How do, you, how do you disciple a whole nation? You preach the gospel to them, and then they receive, they believe that gospel. Then they turn from their evil ways, and they are converted. And then they now stay in the assembly. And then day after day, you are teaching them. You are training them. You are transforming them. You are discipling them. And because of that, their lives were now different. In the market, they were different. In the offices, they were different. In the schools, they were different. Colleges, universities, they were different. In the uh, communities where they were, they were different. People were looking at them. Their lives reminded people of Christ. Their behavior reminded people of Christ. Their dressing, their comportment, their quietness, and their sobriety and their purity reminded them of Christ. And then the, the fellow that was an old uh, girlfriend came to say, where have you been? I've been looking for you. Let's play the same game we were playing before. And then he said, what kind of game? I'm different now. Something happened to me. Since I met the Lord Jesus Christ, I became born again. I'm not interested in that anymore. Your old girlfriend or boyfriend comes. Your boyfriend says, how about you? I just saw your picture. Yesterday, I, said, I didn't know I was going to see you today, and what a wonderful! I saw you now. Say, what, what you are talking about? I'm not in that kind of trade anymore. I'm not, you know, like a private, public prostitute anymore. I'm totally changed. Things are different now. I say, what are you talking about? I'm saying that I met Jesus Christ, the Christ of Calvary, and salvation came into my life, and things are totally different now. The things I used to do, I do them no more. The places I used to go, I go there no more. And the things I used to love, I love them no more. 
more. And the dresses I used to wear, I wear that no more. The things I used to drink, I drink them no more. Something happened to me. We call it salvation. We call it conversion. There's the grace of God that entered into my life. And these, the lives of these people reminded them of Christ. What you see in Nigerian, and then he reminds you of Nigerian. See, that's a Nigerian. You see somebody from Ghana, and his language and his dressing reminds you of Ghana. You say that's a Ghanaian. When you see him, somebody from Europe, and then the way he looks and everything, he reminds you of Europe. You say it's a European. You see somebody from America, and you say this person talks like a person from America. He reminds you of America. You say an American. And when you see somebody, you say he reminds you of Christ. We say what do we call him? Christian. And so, if you are born again and your life is totally different, it, you know, your life will remember, remind people of Christ. You become, you're a real Christian. Look at First Peter. Who is a Christian? Who is a Christian? Number one, somebody who is converted. Who is a Christian? Number two, somebody who is consecrated. Who is a Christian? Number three, somebody who is conformed to Christ. He is converted is consecrated, is conformed unto Christ. And when they see that conversion, when they see that consecration, when they see that conformity to Christ, they say this person reminds me of Christ, his character is no more like a hooligan, it's no more like a rascal, it's no more like a ruffian, it's no more like a street boy, it's no more like a street girl, he reminds me of Christ, this is a Christian. First Peter chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 14, First Peter chapter 4 verse 14 If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, appear ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And on their part is evil spoken of, and but on your part he is glorified. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, no you are a Christian now, or as a thief, you are a Christian now, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as who? As a Christian, not a murderer, a Christian. It's not a thief, it's a Christian. It's not an evil doer, it's a Christian. It's not a busybody in other men's matters, it's a Christian. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And that's what the Lord is telling us in saying that when that grace of God comes to us and he becomes our savior, our master, our Lord, things will be totally different. Our lives will totally change. We're coming back to Acts of the Apostles. We're reading now from chapter 11 and from verse 27. We're coming to the last point, their readiness for the responsibility of a caring ministry. Their readiness for the responsibility of a caring ministry. We're looking at Acts chapter 11 verse 27. And in, the, in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great death throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, everyone according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the, unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent each to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. You see what the Lord is saying here? Uh, prophets came from Jerusalem. Prophets came from Jerusalem. And these uh, prophets revealed that there was going to be a death, a famine. And uh, you see, that's what we're saying. When they heard the word of God, they responded immediately, reacted immediately. It's not like we've had the proclamation of the word of God. Prophets proclaim the mind of God. Prophets proclaim the word of God. Prophets, they proclaim the revelation of God. God reveals something. If it's revealed in the scriptures, he proclaims it. That's a prophet. If it's revealed by the spirit, he proclaims it. That is, uh, that is, uh, that's a prophet. And so, if it's revealed in scripture, if it's revealed by the spirit, and then the, pro the proclaimer of that, that is the prophet. And when the prophets then prophesy, when they proclaim, when they profess, and when they tell us that this, and we'll publish the word of God, what we do is that we act immediately. And this is what they did over here. They acted immediately. And that is what the Lord is telling us. Look at this in verse, in verse 28. And they stood up one of them named Dagabos signified by the spirit that there should be a great death throughout all the world. A great death 
So that the word, that word the earth, the earth means uh, a farming. There's another farming that is raging in the world today. And you can see it all around. Look at Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. A farming that is raging everywhere. And as these people heard that there was a farming, then they got ready all their resources and they sent to those places where the farming was. Look at Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. I'm reading to you from verse 11. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, uh, says the Lord God, that I will send a farming in the land, not a farming of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That's, there's a famine all over the world. Although there are many congregations and many denominations and many assemblies, but there's the lack of the word of God. The word of salvation is missing. The word of holiness is missing. And the word of the power of the Holy Ghost is missing. And the word of a righteous life and upright life in many places, all that word is missing. The famine is there. And as we know that the famine the famine is there, the famine is there, the famine is there. The Lord is saying, send relief unto them. Send the bread of life unto them. Send the word of life and the water of life unto them. Look at verse 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the, the north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. And they shall not find it. They go about seeking the word of the Lord and they are not finding that word of the Lord. That's why the Lord is calling upon you and he's saying, you have the word of life, give it out. You have the water of life, give it out. You have the bread of life, give it out to other people. The Lord is saying, go and tell other people. Go and reveal it to other people. Tell them that Jesus is. Let them tell them that Jesus has died and he wants everyone now to come and whosoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. The Spirit, that's the Holy Ghost, is saying, Come. The bride, that's the bride of Christ. That's the whole church. Every member of the church, everyone that is born again, everyone that has that witness of the Holy Ghost in him that I'm a child of God. I looked up to Calvary. I looked up to the cross, and the blood of Jesus kept flowing from Calvary. Cleanse me. Go and tell other people too. They too can be converted, they too can be cleansed, and they too can be purified, and they too can be made ready for the kingdom of God. The spirit and the bride say, Come and let him that heareth say, Come. You have heard, tell other people to you. You have known, tell other people to you. You have experienced that salvation, that sanctification, that power of the Holy Ghost in your life, and the fulfillment of the promise of God in your life. Go tell other people to you. And him that heareth, let him say, Come and let him that is a thirst, this time of farming and this time of not hearing the word of God, this time of not having the water of life, let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As you call, he will save. As you call, he will sanctify. As you call, he will fill you with the Holy Ghost. And then he makes you now a soul winner, an evangelist, a teacher, a preacher of the word. And you go to tell people before next week you come for Bible study again, you tell other people that this is the word of the Lord. And while you are telling them, and the Lord is turning their lives around for the better, you are bringing them along with you as well. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord himself will make this word a reality in every Every one of our lives. You see these uh, people, they heard the word and they obeyed the word. They heard the word and they responded to the word. They heard the word and very quickly without any delay, they obeyed the word of the Lord. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer that God will help you to be a doer of the word, not only a hearer of the word. You see these people, they started with contention. Contending for tradition, contending for opinions of men, contending for the culture of the Jews. But now the Lord has told us, don't contend for tradition, don't contend for opinion, don't contend against the almighty God. We contend earnestly for the faith, earnestly contending for the faith, was delivered unto the saints. You're telling other people about salvation of the Lord. That, that, that's, that, that's your passion, that's your zeal, that, that's your commitment. And that's your meat, and that's what excites you. Telling everybody every time. And you tell them with zeal. Tell them with passion. Tell them to drive them to, the, to Calvary. Drive them to the cross. Let your life draw people and drive people to Christ. Beautiful life. 
righteous life, holy life, that we can see the grace of God in your life. And remember, the Lord Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost is upon you, he will be the spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. You will not remain in error. You will not remain in forgetfulness when you have the Holy Ghost. He brings the word in our remembrance. Circumcises our hearts. Cleanses us on the inside. Turns us around. Transforms our lives. Makes us pure, righteous, and holy. And your life will remind people of Christ. You'll be a Christian. Your comportment, your language, your seriousness, your single-mindedness, your sobriety will remind people of Christ. Your old life is gone. Your new life has come. You've repented, you've believed, you've turned unto the Lord. Let your life, your zeal, your comportment, your dressing. You don't joke or sin anymore. Joke or dirty language anymore. A new life. A new language. New dressing. Your dressing will not draw people to immorality anymore, will not remind them of the old, licentious, selfish, fleshly, defiled life anymore. Will remind people of holiness of heaven. No anger anymore. No malice anymore. No fighting anymore. If you are born again, no contention anymore if you are born again. No revenge, retaliation anymore. Methodical retaliation. Anymore. Subtle, clever. Retaliation. Never. If you are really born again. You have the mind of Christ, the life of Christ, the comportment of Christ, the conduct, the character of Christ. Your love, your compassion, your sincerity, your transparency will remind people of Christ, a Christian. Will see the grace of God in your life by what it does. We say the righteousness, the evidence of the grace of God. We'll see the purity, the sincerity, the truthfulness, the transparency. That's the evidence of the grace of God. Converted, consecrated. Conformed unto Christ. And in this famine of the world that is raging all over the world, you'll send relief of the word of life, water of life, bread of life, word of salvation to other people who need to know. We need to get saved. We need to have the transforming power of the grace of Christ in their lives. Be obedient. Be a doer of the word.